this parliament and this government will be and needs to be focused on Canadians. I intend to sit down uh, with all party leaders uh, in the coming weeks uh, to talk about their priorities, about how we can work together, but I can tell you it is not in our plans at all to form any sort of formal coalition, formal or informal coalition. Cool the coalition talk. That was the message, as you heard there today, from Prime Minister Justin Trudeau in his first news conference since winning a minority government. He says he won't strike a formal or informal agreement with opposition parties, but he insists he will work with them. The CBC's Salima Shivji joins us now with more. Hi, Salima. Fresh Hello. off the campaign trail, just like the Prime Minister. That's right. Appreciate you making time for us. Let's start off with uh, those comments specifically about the coalition, but also the overall tone in which he delivered them. Yeah, there was so much news in this news conference, but I think the tone is actually top of that list of the news because really there was a marked difference between how he was on the campaign trail. Even in his victory speech on Monday, we heard him really kind of going ahead with that clear mandate talk, you know, really as if this is a clear win. Today, really different, conciliatory. He was much more subdued. It seemed as though there was an effort for him to be prime ministerial in the situation that he's in, of course, in head of a minority government. So he specifically talked about, and you heard in that clip a little bit at the beginning, that regret, you know, over the divisive tone of the campaign. And he included himself in that and the role that he played in that, the attacks that he used to really pull out this win. I want to have you listen to that because it's really interesting. Take a listen. I think Canadians uh, expect us to work together uh, to listen to each other, to figure out a way to move forward that isn't as uh, divisive and um, challenging as this election was. Um, I think there were a lot of issues that weren't properly addressed. I think there were big substantive ideas that weren't fully debated uh, in, in this election campaign, and I regret that, and I recognize um, that much of this campaign uh, tended to be around me, uh, and I do hold a bit of responsibility for that. So, Vashi, building on that conciliatory tone, he talked about, you know, Canadians expecting his government to work with the other parties, to really work together, uh, and he will reflect on how best to do that. So he talked a lot about reflection, actually, in this Use the word conference. a lot. <laughs> all the time, all the time. He talked about no formal coalition. As you said off the top, he'll work with people on and parties on a case-by-case -case basis. He talked about also how he interprets the results from Monday, and really that it's a clear message from voters that they do want action on a couple of key issues. Also words that he said over and over again, the fight uh, for movement on climate change as well as affordability. So he kept coming back to that as an expectation from Canadians. Uh, and he did mention those over and over again. He says he expects progressive voters to also vote for his first order, uh, progressive parties rather, to vote for his first order of business, which is to lower taxes for the middle class, even though he, they voted uh, against some of the things that he did in his first mandate. He mentioned specifically uh, the child, Canada child benefit and whatnot. But he expects them to all come forward on his first order of business. One thing that's not changing, and there's really no legislative of reason for it too, since it's been approved as the Trans Mountain Pipeline. He did say that he will go ahead on that, as well as his position on Quebec's Bill 21 hasn't changed at all. Yeah, and on those legislative priorities, that first piece that he talked about, the tax break, that was the promise that the Liberals made during the campaign to essentially, over time, increase the amount of your income that That's goes right. tax-free from twelve to fifteen thousand dollars. Again, that will be over time. He, you, you, you uh, noted there how he he did reflect on some of the reasons for the outcome. He was he was also asked specifically about the outcome in Alberta. Alberta and Saskatchewan, where the Liberals, of course, have no representation and why he thought that would be, or why he thought that happened. He didn't reflect too much on that. He, he tried to put the focus instead on how to rectify it, or at least how to deal with it moving forward. What did he say about moving forward? That's right. He really put the focus on looking forward instead of looking backwards, instead of sort of analyzing why they were wiped out. But I think the question for so many people after Monday night was really, how do you properly represent uh, a region where you have no members of cabinet there? Uh, so basically, he was asked about that. He says he's reaching out to a lot of people across the board. He spoke with uh, Premiers Jason Kenney and Scott Moe yesterday. He says he also spoke with a lot of mayors. Interestingly, he mentioned Calgary Mayor Nahid Nenshi Toys. Who will be on the show oh, at excellent. today. Stay tuned for that. <laughs> excellent. Uh, looking forward to that one. Uh, also, other mayors, too. He specifically by name mentioned the mayors of Regina, Saskatoon, as well as uh, Edmonton. So he's going to be talking about to them. He mentioned different approaches. Uh, the fact that, you know, there have been governments in the past that did not have representation from certain regions. So sort of perhaps opening the door to that being a possibility. Uh, let's listen to a little bit more about what he had to say on this front. 
why did this happen is not the central issue we have. The central issue for me is how do we move forward in a way that responds to the concerns that uh, Albertans and, uh, and Saskatchewanians have uh, clearly expressed. This is something that matters to me and uh, we're going to work very, very hard to ensure that this government acts in ways that benefits everyone across the country. So work very hard to ensure that, but not, uh, still a lot of questions as to what that will look like. Uh, he's leaving the door open to a lot of possibilities. In terms of the makeup of Trudeau's new cabinet, we do have some news on that front as well. That will be on November 20th that the cabinet will be sworn in, and it will be gender balanced uh, again, because it's 2019, right? The countdown is on November 20th. Thank you, Salima. Thanks You're so welcome. much for, your, for this and also for your work on the campaign trail. I really appreciate it. The not CBC's Salima Shivji. I think it's extremely important that uh, the government works for all Canadians. And as I have uh, endeavoured to do over the past years, and as I will do even more uh, now, deliberately, I will be reaching out to uh, leaders across the country, be reaching out specifically to Westerners uh, to hear from them. I spoke with uh, both uh, Premiers of uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan yesterday, uh, but I'm also speaking with people, people like uh, Mayor Nahid Nenshi and others uh, to to talk about how we can make sure that the concerns, the very real concerns of Albertans are being addressed and reflected uh, by, uh, by this government. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is vowing to do more for the West. Speaking to reporters today there for the first time since his minority win, Trudeau acknowledged anger and alienation in Alberta and Saskatchewan where the Liberals failed to secure a single seat. As you heard, Trudeau says he's reaching out to Western leaders like Calgary Mayor Nahed Nenshi about how to repair those divisions. Mayor Nenshi joins us now via Skype from Calgary. Hi, Mayor. Nice to see you. Thanks for making time for us. Great to see you. I think we're still both upright after the marathon on Monday night, so it's happy to be back with you. <laughs> Somewhat upright. You look a lot more upright than me. Uh, let me ask you about the conversa conversation rather that the Prime Minister referenced this morning. Uh, he said that you talked and he, he wanted to make sure concerns of Albertans are being addressed. What did you tell him? Well, you know, it's not every morning that you get a call from the Prime Minister while you're shaving in the morning, and I was happy to have the call. And I was happy that, you know, 36 hours after he was elected, he sees this as a very real concern, because it is a very real concern. You know, I think Albertans as a whole have really been frustrated um, because I don't think that the message is really getting through. And, you know, even on, on Monday night, uh, on election night, I talked a little about this, and I was surprised at how many people were surprised. So maybe before I get into what we talked about, I can just say that, well, Alberta has always been the economic engine of Canada, and even though sometimes we complain about all the resources that flow from Alberta into the rest of the country, I think we're secretly kind of proud that our success has enabled so much success across Canada, that even that we've welcomed people here from across the country to come and live and work and have dreams uh, at here. The challenge is right now, the economy is firing on all cylinders, everywhere except in Alberta and Saskatchewan. The economic engine of the country is sputtering. And the argument that we're making is, look, if it continues to sputter, then you'll never balance the federal budget. The national economy will suffer and our nation building experiment will suffer. So we've got to figure out what to do to help Alberta. And that doesn't mean denying climate change. It doesn't mean stepping back on our environmental stewardship. But it does mean supporting the energy sector, getting away from these divisive politics that we've seen uh, of late and really being able to move forward in a way that makes sense for the whole country. And that's the argument that I've been making for many, many months now, and something that I reiterated with the Prime Minister today, though I need to tell you he didn't need to hear it. He understood that. So why do you, why do you get the impression that he didn't need to hear it and that he understands it? Is it based on uh, the outcome of the election or something more? A bit of both. You know, uh, this wasn't a fun election, I think, for anybody, and maybe for the pundits, but... He uh, very clearly understood the message from the election. The fact that he was calling me 36 hours after being elected to talk about this, I think that the clip that you played, I didn't see it myself, but I think that was like the first sentence of his first post-election press conference. So I think these are the sorts of things that send a signal, a good signal, that the issues matter. And the real issue question for me now is where do we go from here? On that point, there is some speculation here about how uh, the Prime Minister and his government will address the gap that exists in representation now, right? The fact that there isn't a Liberal MP essentially from Winnipeg to Vancouver, and particularly that Saskatchewan and Alberta won't be represented at the Cabinet table. What do you think should happen? 
Well, we did talk about that this morning, uh, and certainly there are some conventions, some parliamentary conventions that uh, the Prime Minister could use. Before you ask, Ashi, no, he did not offer me a job. I was about to ask. But I, <laughs> <laughs> were you really about to ask? I really was, yes. That would have been a more fun announcement, but no, that is not what <laughs> this was about. Um, <laughs> no, I think many, many people, I think maybe you've asked it before, because I've gotten a lot of text messages offering me sublets in Ottawa, but no, that is not uh, <laughs> what we talked about. Um, what we really talked about is, yes, there is that issue that is interesting to political scientists and pundits. Uh, and I you know he's got a number of options um, in parliamentary convention that he can do there. I think really um, what I said to him, it's really important for you to understand the perspective from us from Alberta in particular, to make sure you've got advisors and people in your circle who really get that. Uh, I suggested that, of course, I would be happy, as I always am, to work with politicians of any stripe to make sure that Calgary and Alberta are successful and Canada is successful. And I know he's reached out to other mayors and other leaders across the country. But I also said to him, listen, I know what Premier Kenny's, my Premier's stance has been here. I also know that when you read Premier Kenny's open letter to the Prime Minister yesterday, it's not unreasonable. You know, it lays out a roadmap, and yes, there are some landmines and some traps in that roadmap, but it does lay out a framework from which we might be able to work together. You know, not all the Premiers have done that, let's put it that way. And so I also remember myself of Premier Peter Lougheed, you know, I, I was just a baby, but the mythology is legendary that he had massive fights with the elder Prime Minister Trudeau, but they also worked together to repatriate the Constitution. And there, I think, are opportunities for us to be able to work in a way that both meets the needs of Albertans. we got to get that pipeline built, and I strongly suggest it. I'd love to hear of some very serious language on that, and I think there was some in his press conference today. But beyond that, how do we build our economy, protect the environment, and build the nation? And here in Alberta, you know, we could continue to be super angry, or we could try and figure out how to work together uh, with the government that we now have. And of course, I favor the latter. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for making time for us this evening, Marinetti. Pleasure to have you back on the show. Thank you. Time for the power panel. Kelly Kreiderman of the Globe and Mail joins us from Calgary. Over in Regina, political commentator Sally Hauser. Columnist and political commentator Tiffany Gooch joins us in Toronto. And here with me in Ottawa, Ernst Cliff Strategy Group's Jeff Norquay and the CBC's own John Paul Tasker. Hi, everybody. Hi, Let me ask about those, you, about those divisions, Kelly, because you're in the heart of where they, well, you and Sally, in the heart of where they exist most prominently. The fact that there is no representation from Winnipeg to Vancouver of the Liberals. I want to play a quick clip today of the Prime Minister addressing that and then get your reaction, Kelly. We made the decision to move forward on the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion because it was in Canada's uh, interest to do so, because the environment and the economy need to go together. We will be continuing uh, with the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion. So that's obviously addressing concern uh, that, that, that perhaps because of the new makeup of Parliament, TMX will be stalled or, or for whatever reason won't go ahead. Do you think his words will be any comfort to people uh, in Alberta today, Kelly? I think, I think it will provide some clarity. We know that there is no plan legislation on the, tr the Trans Mountain expansion. There was nothing that necessarily had to go through the House of Commons. I think the concern out here is when the Liberals govern in w with a minority, they will have to make decisions with the NDP, with the Bloc, um, and that could drag them away from support for the energy sector. And I, I think that will be a big problem. He's uh, addressing it. He's saying he can make deals on an ad hoc basis. That's certainly better than any optics of, you know, uh, for in Alberta for, for uh, than an NDP member being in a federal cabinet. And I, and I think that's going to be really difficult for the prime minister going forward. And maybe there's, you know, a realization today, you know, 48 hours or not even 48 hours after the campaign of how difficult bridging all these regional divides will be with no representation in Alberta and Saskatchewan and figuring out how to get someone in close to him and someone in cabinet 
who can reflect the interests who will also be a political ally of the Liberals. And that's going to be difficult. And it's interesting, JP, because it, it, he was asked multiple times about how he would do that, whether it means uh, appointing somebody who isn't yeah. elected to cabinet. And he kind of said, well, there's been other instances. Uh, you know, he did acknowledge, of course, the concerns, but said there have been other instances where not every province was represented. Right. The cabinet there aren't table. very many in history, though. You know, even looking back in Jean Chrétien and Paul Martin days, there was somebody from Western Canada. You had Anne McClellan in there from Edmonton who could be that voice around the table. I think, you know, if they don't come up with some solution, it's really going to be a finger in the eye of Western Canada because, let's be honest, a lot of this anger that we saw expressed on Monday really comes from some of the Liberal government's policies. Uh, we can run through them if you want. You know, Bill C-69, Rachel Notley, the NDP Premier, called that a stampede of stupid. You know, the Northern BC oil tanker ban bill has basically killed any chance of a pipeline through Northern British Columbia. Any other way to get oil to markets overseas. Let's not forget they killed Northern Gateway and some regulatory changes also basically killed Energy East. So there's a lot of reasons for why Albertans and Saskatchewan are genuinely, genuinely upset. There's some substantive reasons, it, you know, the blowback isn't irrational. So I think they have to have somebody around that table or someone, maybe perhaps a privy councillor or a senator, who can sub in when these big decisions are being made so that they don't go further down the line of, you know, really peeving off Western Canada. They seem to have done that very well in the first four years of their government. They need to have a course correction of sorts, I think, now. Tiffany, what do you think? I mean, the Prime Minister was asked to reflect today on the reasons for the way the vote ended up in Western Canada, and he said, I, I think it was, he said that's not the central issue for him. He wants to focus instead on how to rectify it going forward. Yeah, so I think that he's going to be looking for ways to collaborate at this point. And so there are a lot of ways, there's a, a, a myriad of ways that he can do that. Of course, uh, the, the uh, relationships he's been building with municipal leaders over the last few years, I'm sure, plays a role here in ensuring that uh, the voices of that region are heard. But, uh, of course, there have been many times uh, that we've uh, we've had regions uh, in Canada that didn't have representation in Cabinet. And uh, I think there are a lot of different ways for uh, for this government to, to look at that uh, that whole and ensure that uh, that those voices are being heard as decisions are being made. Sally, what do you think? You know, I think it's interesting here. The, the Prime Minister seemed to today, uh, and has to, uh, or should at least at his own peril, um, recognize that the, the feelings of alienation are real in, in Western Canada, certainly in Saskatchewan and Alberta. Uh, but I think e uh, equally you see the rhetoric coming out of Jason Kenney uh, and Scott Moe that despite, you know, the big conservative sweep in those provinces, uh, that there is a not insignificant portion of the population that didn't <coughs> vote for conservatives. Uh, so as much as you're talking about, okay, Trudeau has to represent all of Canada, those premiers, you know, should also be thinking we have to represent our whole province. Um, you know, if I was Justin Trudeau, I'd probably get on a, on a plane uh, pretty fast out west. Uh, you saw today him saying, listen, TMX is going to get built. Uh, that's happening. Uh, to the point about kind of governing with the NDP, I mean, Jagmeet Singh has obviously said that he completely is against uh, the further development of TMX, uh, but one, presumably, if we're talking about a minority situation, that the Conservatives would support any movement to make that happen. Uh, if I was guessing, I would say that the NDP is probably going to focus more on keeping uh, the, the Liberals to their, holding them to their promises of ph uh, pharmacare, housing, childcare, uh, things like that. I know that Jagmeet Singh uh, spoke with Rachel uh, Notley er earlier today, and while they continue to fundamentally... Is that the first time they've TMX, spoken? <laughs> <laughs> uh, honestly, that's an honest question. I, I'm not even saying that facetiously only because I remember asking many times and they, they both were saying no. Is, is that one of the first times they've spoken? N not in the history of, you know, of time, the world. Uh, but <laughs> cer time certainly since election, uh, cer certainly since election day. So that's obviously an issue that they fundamentally continue to disagree on, uh, you know, but they have so many th more things in common and I, I, I'm sure that they will continue to have a working relationship going forward as well. <laughs> Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.